Well, good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord. So good to see all you guys and pray everybody as well. And uh, as our custom, we'll have our opening prayer. And today we bless, we have Lorelai, it's going to come and uh, lead us in our prayer. Welcome, Lorelai. Let us bow our heads together. Let us pray. Dear God, this church is a family. Help us to learn together, to worship together, to share together, to play together, to pray together, to come together, and to reach out to everyone with family love. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, I think. All right, without further ado, will you please stand for our call to worship. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn today is number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Let us sing together.
Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time we'd like to have a moment of silent prayer and then we'll go into the pastoral prayer and then we'll have the Lord's Prayer together. So let us bow together for a moment of silent prayer. Most gracious Lord, we humbly come before thy throne today, and we come to you with, with our hearts, Lord. And first today, Lord, I pray for Miss Ruby. We lift her up to your throne. She's there in the hospital, and we just pray for the doctors and nurses and those that are with her father. Give them wisdom. We also pray for Joanne's uh, husband who fell and who is needing surgery today. We pray that you may also watch over him and Help the doctors and nurses and all that are working to, to do well. We just give them to you. Also, we pray for Joanne, O oh Lord. Pray that you will give her peace in her heart and presence. And we just lift her to you. We also know, Lord, within the church, we have many others that have had surgeries and sicknesses and heartaches. And we just pray, Father, and we lift all them to you. But Lord, as we pray, we come to you acknowledging our need of you, our love of you. And we just pray your blessings. In thy holy name we do pray. Amen. And the children of the Lord pray together the Lord the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 399. Take my life and let it be. Let us sing together.
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, we're blessed today with uh, special music, uh, Elizabeth and Brandon. The song is entitled, Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing. so much. That was just beautiful. I was uh, watching some praise music on TV this morning, and I'm going to have to say Brandon and Elizabeth are better. Amen. Just give them praise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I do apologize. Uh, you know, some weeks we have difficult things. So this last week, my phone decided to uh, crash. That's always fun. And then, uh, then a couple of days later, my computer decided to crash. And that's not fun at all. But anyway, uh, long story short, the uh, correct scripture did not get put into the bulletin. I apologize for that. It got lost in space somewhere. So our actual text this morning, and I pray you have your Bibles, invite you with me. So the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. We're looking at uh, the, the, the prince of Tyre, or king of Tyre. And um, anyway, his message that he receives from God, uh, and it's a hard one. But I pray today that we'll look upon the word and that it will sink in. So Ezekiel 28, beginning in verse 1, we pick up this word. So the word of the Lord came to me, mortal, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is proud and you have said, 
I am a God. I said in the seats of the gods, in the heart of the seas, yet you are but a man and no God. And though you compare your mind with the mind of a God, you are indeed wiser than Daniel. And no secret is hidden from you. And by your wisdom and your understanding, you have amassed wealth for yourself and have gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. And by your great wisdom and trade, you have increased your wealth and your heart has become proud in your wealth. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you compare your mind with the mind of a God, therefore I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations. They shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall thrust you down to the pit, and you shall die a violent death in the heart of the seas. And will you still say, I am a God, in the presence of those who kill you? Though you are but a mortal and no God, in the hands of those who wound you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised, by the hand of foreigners, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may you open our hearts to your word today. Speak to us. In thy name we pray. Amen. Well, y'all might have preferred that I stayed in the book of John. I'm not sure. But anyway, we'll give this a little try today, okay? But I have great concern today. My heart is burdened today, if you would. We live in a world today, after the two years of COVID, where it seems so many have just taken God out of their lives. There is no time to come to church. There is no time to read the Bible. There is no time to pray. There's no time to take food to a sick person or go to the, somewhere to visit or to check on. They have basically and literally just have tuned out and tuned away and have gone to be with the world as we see in the days of Noah. They have gone to eat, drink, and be merry. And thus there's their life. No time for God. And I'm concerned about that because we see that so much. So many of our churches are, are suffering. So many empty pews. So many people that used to come that do not come. And thus concerned. I was watching a Joel Osteen a little while this morning. And they did a panoramic, you know, of that big stadium. And uh, always, normally, when you see the panoramic, it's full uh, but this morning there was big empty places all the way around. So even old brother Joel's having a little trouble getting the people to come in. We're living in a society where people have no concern about their relationship with the Lord. They have literally tuned out and they have joined the world. And it's disconcerting. The reality is, I want to ask you, do we have a living God or not? Is there truly the living God or should we just all go eat, drink and be merry with everybody else and forget about any relationship with God? And of course, I'm going to say there is the living God. Do you know how many times the Bible uses those two words? Living God? I'll tell you, 30 times. The Bible refers to, our, to God 30 times as the living God. God. And of course, we all know that and understand that. We also understand that we are to understand the Lord, one, the Bible says, by his creation. In other words, by beholding the very beauty of what we live in, by beholding the beauty of ourselves, uh, that God has created us by, you know, the other day I was watching some birds and some deer that were just over there and, you know, looking at the trees and the beautiful blue sky and I'm just like, what a wonderful world. And that's what we'd understand, that God has created this. He is our creator. And the problem is, we have many today that want to deny God his creation. Remember what 
Paul said in the book of Romans, chapter 1, 19 and 20, he said it this way, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has show it, shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We are to understand the Lord through the creation in one sense. But secondly, we know we understand the living God by His Word and the Holy Spirit. God comes to us and reveals His self to us. And what do we learn from that? Well, first and foremost, we learn that God is the Creator, thus separate from His creation. We are not pantheists. We do not understand it in that sense that it, God is just in. No, God is separate from His creation. God created all that we see out of nothing. Ex nihilo is the, the old Latin phrase. God created it. God is separate. He exists alone, apart from all. God is the creator of time. God is the creator of space. God is not bound by time nor space. He is the creator of these things. God exists. God lives. We know that God loves. We know that God is kind. We know that God has patience. We also know God is a God of justice and holiness and righteousness. So thus, we are able to have a relationship and an understanding of our Creator. And then, of course, throw in the, the rest of the story through Jesus Christ. And we're able to have a born-again experience with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and that relationship with Him. I don't know about you, but see, I need God. See, I wake up in the morning needing a relationship with God. Anybody with me? I wake up in the morning needing a time of prayer. I wake up in the morning needing a time to, to pour over the Scriptures. I wake up in the morning needing like, you know what, Lord? So-and-so needs help today and lift them in prayer. And that's, that is that relationship. But so many today have gone away, disappeared, so often maybe joined the world. Psalms 14, 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's an interesting word there, fool. In the Hebrew, it is naval, N-A-B-A-L. How many of you have a green thumb? Anybody have a green thumb with your plants? Oh, thank you, Carol. I got one. One of y'all, that's it? What the rest of you? Come on. But anyway, well, I, I'm the opposite of a green thumb. I'm like brown thumb. I don't know, but whatever it is. But I'm the opposite. And, uh, you know, I'll plant some plants and, you know, come over here to Bastrop, go back home, and then they're, they're all withered and, and dead. Something happened, you know. Didn't do something right. And, uh, and that's what Nabal means. Nabal means withered. No juice left, no water dried up. The fool that said in his heart, there is no God, is, is one that is dried up, has lost the meaning of life. Remember, Jesus said, I come to give you abundant life. Jesus came to give us joy. Jesus came to give us happiness and, 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 to, and celebration of him. But Nabal is lifeless. Juiceless, and thus the comparison. So why would people want to walk away from God? Well, there's many reasons. One of those is the sense they hope to never be judged by God. And we have a lot of that floating around, and it's, all, it's been around forever. But Jesus says, there will be the day. The book of Revelation tells us the day. The book of Matthew tells us a day. Mark. Luke, a day. But the world doesn't want to face that day. Secondly, we find that those that are the fool, their lives tend to be corrupt, full of corruption, because they've joined the world and the things of the world. And thus today we, we want to look at, and we're going to see here this Prince of Tyre, his name actually in the Hebrew is uh, Ethbel. You actually would pronounce it Eth Baal, but that's a whole other thing. So Eth Bel, which means one of Bel, 
he became so arrogant and prideful and boastful that he, we find these things about him. So Ezekiel comes and we find that Ethbel, he says to himself, I am a God. Wow, that takes it pretty far, right? Many of us, we would be like, um, you know, uh, I'm a nice guy. I haven't really hurt anybody. I haven't really done anything too bad, right? But I don't think anybody here would say, you know what, I'm a God. I don't know, maybe some of you, but anyway, I hope not, right? You might think of that, but, but Ethbel, he, he decided, you know what, I'm a God. And, we'll, and I'll tell you why he did that in just a minute, but I'm a God. But it gets even more interesting in the Hebrew. See, Mel, Melech was the local God. That was the territorial God of that area of time. And what we find implied in the Hebrew was is that, that Ethbel was not satisfied to be just a regional God. He has to use the term El, short for Elohim. He is the supreme God. In other words, he's not just willing to be satisfied with being a local God. He's elevating himself all the way that he is the God. And there is no one greater or bigger than him in any way. And I don't know about you, but that is pretty arrogant, is it not? Amen. For a man to claim to be the God of all. Well, why did he say that? Why did he do that? Well, beside the corruptness of his heart, first and foremost, we find that he was smarter than anyone around him. The Bible says, and God says in this, you're even smarter than Daniel. Now, anybody that's read the Bible, we always, man, Daniel, that was the wise one, you know, he knew. But God says that Ethbel was smarter than Daniel. How many of you watch Je Jeopardy in the afternoon? Anybody watch Jeopardy? How many of you watch it and feel like, man, I don't, do not know anything. Anybody with me on that? You know, maybe some of you know all the answers. Praise God. But I'm absolutely amazed sometimes of the answers they come up with. Now, I'm really good in the Bible, though. I can answer those. But anyway, but a lot of those, I don't have it. I don't know the answer. And they're really smart. There's an organization, and in, in, I guess worldwide, it's called the, the Minsna. Minsna, you know, that I'm saying it wrong, but you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, and some of our people, some of our members are members of that. And they're really smart. But I don't think any of them would say, I'm a God. And not only my God, I am the greatest God. I pray we would. So he thought he was so smart. Thought he knew everything. No one could outsmart him. And because he was so smart, God even alludes, he was able to collect vast amounts of wealth. Gold and silver. And I kind of picture, remember the, the, uh, the old movies and you could see a, a room full of gold coins and silver coins and jewels and just, just wealthy beyond imagination. And that's the way Ethbel was. He was considered himself the wealthiest man in all the world. Now, now, maybe here in the church, some of you think you're very smart, and maybe some of you think that you're wealthier than anybody else, but I'm going to have to say this. You haven't given in the tithe. I haven't seen any tithes that are wealthy of the whole world. I haven't seen that. So you're holding out. But this man, Ethbel, he had no shame. His prideness, his wealth, his connections, his power, his corruption. He didn't care about anybody but himself. That was all. Now, what's missing though? What's missing here? Well, we call it repentance. Psalms 23, remember? He restores my soul. And the literal translation is, he brings it back. We might, from time to time, get a little off track. We might, for a little time, join the world a little bit. We might, for a time, not really go to church, not really pray, not really read the Bible, not really help anybody. 
But then the Spirit comes, moves on us. And that's what repentance is about. But we find that Ethbel is so hard-hearted that here God is coming, and what is God telling to him? The judgment is coming. Strangers are going to come upon you. And they would. We have the historical record. The Babylonians come. They will attack Tyre for 13 years. God, in a way, brings his judgment upon him that here you are, you think you're a god, you think you're so smart, you think you have more wealth than anybody, more power than anybody, but I am telling you, I, the true Lord, am telling you, a stranger will bring you down. A stranger will bring you down. And it's kind of religious the way the Lord does it in the words. Now, since he was the king of Tyre and he had all this money, we can assume he had all kind of things he had built for his glory. Whether they be temples or whether they be edifices or whatever it might be been for the people. And what God says to him, a stranger will come and desecrate your glory. You think you're all that, but a stranger will come and desecrate all you've built, all you've made, all that you've done will come to naught. And that's the judgment. Now, we are blessed that we're able to move forward with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you come to me and tell me that you're a God and that you have all wisdom and that you have all money, I'm going to set you down and tell you about the gospel message. Amen. That's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to hope you tithe. No, that's a whole nother answer. But anyway, that's what I'm going to do. Because the reality is we have the blessing of the gospel. And no matter how far off we've gotten the path, the Lord brings us back. His love, His grace, His comfort. We live in a day and time that's all around us. 80% of our population never attends a worship service anymore, ever, all year long. 80%. Only 20% attend church. You're, you're part of the 20. Praise God. But we live in a world. I was doing a little research last night and some of the very famous people that we see on TV and, you know, they make millions and millions of dollars. But anyway, here's what some of them had to say about God. Angelina Jolie, she said, there doesn't need to be a God for me. She doesn't need a God. She's got all she wants. I was kind of sad. Old Bruce Willis, he was raised a Lutheran. But he has no time for organized religion or care for organized religion today. Daniel Radcliffe, he played Harry Potter, if you don't remember. Absolute atheist. Dami Helen Mirren, she's won I don't know how many Academy Awards, you'd see her, you know her. Says she doesn't believe in God and never bothers to pray. Why should she? Jodie Foster, she said, I, I don't believe in God, but I love religion. But anyway, there you go. Kevin Bacon, he's been on TV for decades. Ironically, he doesn't believe in God, but... If he was going to have a God, hope I can say this, it's all right, it, it'd be a sex God for him. Morgan Freeman, ironically, he played God, if you remember, in Bruce Almighty. But Morgan Freeman, he doesn't believe in God, and in fact, God is a man-made creation in our minds. Now, Kathy Griffin, she's serious, she's a militant atheist, I'll tell you so, a militant atheist. Atheist is what she says. Who, Laurie, who played house for all those years. Absolute atheist. Julian Moore, atheist. Seth MacFarlane, he said this. I have no time for the invisible man living in the sky. We have very acclaimed atheists in our world today. Richard Dawkins. He wrote The God Delusion, very popular. Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, and of course Stephen Hawkins, Hawken, 
all acclaimed atheists. It's interesting what world we live in. Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo, lived about 1,700 years ago. He wrote this. He said, that albeit there be some who think or will persuade themselves that there is no God, yet the most vile and desperate wretch that ever lived would not say there was no God. Do you see that? 1,700 years ago, according to St. Augustine, maybe somebody would think there's really not a God, but by golly, they would never ever say that in public. And look how far we've gone today. So what's my concern? My concern, brothers and sisters, is that we're being pulled into the world and we might just disappear unless we wake up, take the scales off, Holy Spirit, word sink in, and that we're serious about our faith. So I'm going to tell you, those atheists are. They're very serious about their faith. And we're living in a time where just to kind of be mediocre, well, I think we're just going to be joined in. And that's my concern. You know, I guess what hurts a lot is we call people that used to come. We email people that used to come. We try to visit people that used to come. And we get nothing. You know, I'd rather know that you're mad at me than not to know. Is that an amen? I appreciate those of you. And sometimes it's a little rough. But it's okay. Because we're all grown-ups here. We can make it work. But I just hate when people just disappear. And go away. But my prayer is that we are the body of Christ. And that we will... Glorify his holy name. I need God. How about you? I need God. One famous uh, quote, finally, from, a, a, from an atheist uh, close to his deathbed. Probably one of the most famous atheists of all times. George, George Bernard Shaw, who wrote a lot of plays and literature and was very famous. Really lived, I think, to 94 so from the 1850s up to the 1950s, I think 54, he died. And he was a renowned atheist throughout the world. But towards his end, he did write this. Now, he never confessed uh, uh, conversion, but here is what he penned. He said it this way. The science to which I penned my faith is bankrupt. It couples which should have established the millennium led, instead, directly to the suicide of Europe. I believed them once. In their name, I helped to destroy the faith of millions of worshipers and the temples of a thousand creeds. And now they look at me and witness the great tragedy of an atheist who has lost his those are the words of George Bernard Shaw. So today, brothers and sisters, the Lord loves you. The Lord knows you. He knows how many hairs are upon your hair, head. He knows you by name. The book, what does the book of Revelation say? Our names have been recorded in the book of life. Amen. I brought that earlier, one of the services, and I kind of was like, you know that, and and then, of course, I got to thinking, well, I hope my name is in the book of life. Amen. But anyway, there you go. But our names are in the book of life. And God lives. And God is alive. And we need him. And he loves us. So I don't know. Life with the Lord just doesn't get much better. Amen. Doesn't get any better. They can have the world. We will have Christ. In Jesus name. Well, the word of the Lord has gone out. I pray that the Lord has touched your hearts today. 
Pray that your faith will be renewed and that we will dedicate ourselves to the Lord. If you're able, we're going to stand and sing our, our final hymn, number 707, Hymn of Promise. Let us stand, let us sing. Thank you so much for being here today. So good to have you. Pray the Lord will bless you and hope to see you again uh, next Sunday. Let us bow and have our closing benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you all. Amen.